this session will be between uh, lunch, but it's such an exciting session, generative AI, that I know that lunch will be actually what will be in the way of <laughs> you know, continuing the, the discussion. And so we have a wonderful uh, a panel to discuss about that, you know, uh, we've already kind of mentioned it before, you know, uh, Vlad told us that uh, generative AI is not creative AI, uh, but it's something that nonetheless, you know, uh, can create things that is actually in the field of what we used to believe, you know, was actually something that was totally specifically for human beings, and so we can see how it can help. It raises a lot of new questions, and it's one of the big topics in education because it has kind of uh, disrupted a few of the practices that actually we also try to disrupt in some ways with our work on creativity and critical thinking, uh, but it has also disrupted some of the argument that we have to say why it was so important. And so we have a, a wonderful a panel. Uh, so we invited Gabriela Ramos, uh, the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, who cannot make it, but we have uh, Maya Grazia Squicciarini, who is the Director for Social Policies at UNESCO, who can join us, and uh, former colleague, and so it's such a pleasure to see you, and, and Gabriela was also a former colleague, so it's a kind of, uh, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. Um, we have uh, uh, um, Oli Pekka Heinonen, and, and who joined us, uh, so it's going to be a hybrid session, so, and thank you so much, uh, Oli Pekka, for joining us, and who is uh, the CEO of the Intellectual Baccalaureate. As you know, the IB uh, is doing a lot of work and has done a lot of work on uh, critical thinking for a long time, and, uh, you know, really embodies, you know, the kind of um, innovative ways of, of, of educating. And, and, and Oli Pekka is also a former minister of education in Finland and, and very famous in that role, you know, that was uh, the time of all the, the reform uh, um, uh, in Finland that led to, to you know, the, well, to every, all of us knowing about Finland and education. Uh, and finally, we have Todd Lubat, last but not least, uh, uh, who is one of the big experts on creativity, professor uh, uh, at the University of uh, Paris-Sorbonne. And uh, is it that? Is it the right name? Paris-Cité. Paris-Cité, sorry about that, you know. Yeah. All the French universities have changed names, so yeah. I'm, I'm, sli couple, I'm slightly confused. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we're going to so we're going to have uh, you know first round of, of 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 introductions and then actually I will you know hand the floor to you and and to uh, to ask also some uh, a few questions. So I'll start with uh, you, uh, Maya Grazia. Uh, UNESCO has managed to actually have uh, you know the first big global um, recommendation on on the ethics of AI, and but that was before generative AI. And so, what does it change, and what do you see are you know the kind of new challenges that it brings, and, and what can we learn about it in education? Thank you. It really is a pleasure to be back at OECD after more than two years that I moved to UNESCO. But as you can see, the ties are still very much there. Let me, uh, okay, I, I'm not sure how much uh, you know about the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence that UNESCO got adopted by 193 member states in 2021 after two years of working, and this in the UN time is really fast because normally it takes no less than four years to get a recommendation. But I think we already felt the pressure and actually that was one of the reasons for the United States to come back to UNESCO as declared by uh, Blinken, for instance. Now, why do we think that's important and why do we think it's still timely, despite the fact that it's true, since the recommendation was published, um, generative uh, AI came through. Now, I was working at AI also before, by the time I was here at the OECD, and to be frank with you, those in the business saw it coming. And if anything, if we talk today about uh, generative AI, we're talking about the past because what we should be worried about is interactive AI. It is quantum AI. Uh, scientists say we are 10 years away, more or less, from um, quantum AI. Well, they said the same about generative AI, and it's already with us. So we might be thinking that in five years, it might be there with us. So we should think differently. 
And the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence of UNESCO did exactly that. If you open that document, you have values, you have principles, but you don't find a strict definition of AI. Why? Because it's a technology that evolves all the time. So having a strict definition would have entailed very likely to have an instrument, a normative instrument, that is already old by the time it is adopted. And this was exactly the thing to avoid. And as a lot of normative instruments, it, um, of course, it contains principles and um, values. But we added 10 areas in which there was a, near, a clear need of policy action, and one of them is education and skills. And so we go back to what we are discussing today. Why? Well, because contrary to what everybody thinks about generative AI, if anything, is asking people to be endowed with even more skills. And the analysis that exists out there, including my own, but all the other, says exactly the same thing. The trick is in the mix. That is, it doesn't suffice anymore to be, have people that are extremely well-versed in, say, technical skills, or extremely well-versed in and are endowed with social-emotional skills. The worker of today and tomorrow, and we do see that there are some components of the skills uh, pattern that remain from yesterday to today, in the analysis that exists about AI, different types of, are a mix between certain types of cognitive skills, of course, the programmers, the Python, the like, the readiness to deal with digital tools and, uh, and uh, means, but much more than yesterday and very likely less than tomorrow, we need, for instance, program management, we need teamwork, we need ability to cope with change. And let me be again provocative, we are here talking about education, but we should stop talking about education as such and we should start talking about education and training. Because this idea that we have um, a linear sequence whereby you grow up, you go to school, then off you go to work, it's something that will hurt our people because there will always be, I mean, OECD and both UNESCO have been very vocal about that in the past already, but we have to shift the mentality from going back to school to learning throughout in different ways. And generative AI can indeed help if managed the right way. It's always an issue between balancing the opportunities and containing the risk. It's not a substitution. It's an added tool which needs to be managed in the right way because, among other things, just to mention one, generative AI creates its own sources. So unless you know how to check, and unless, of course, and this is, for instance, in the recommendation that is requires to quote and uncover what are the sources, well, then you might jump into, re into evidence which has never been produced, and there's no source. So there are several issues to be taken care of at the same level, but it's, as I said, it's about changing the, word, the, the meaning of what we use today. The recommendation remains very valid, and we actually have a paper about what it means for generative AI, but it will be also relevant for the interactive AI, which we are going to see very soon. So can you, before I go to Oli Becker, can you tell us about, you know, so what is coming, you know, for those who don't know, you know, what, what, is, what do you think are the new, you know, challenges and why do, do we have them? In education or in real in, life? Go ahead. Both. <laughs> so um, what we see is that, of course, you will have to change the way you do your job and the component of your job. You will have to teach very likely more critical thinking than before because discriminating the huge amount of information that circulates as they are there, it's, uh, it's a challenging business. And let's not forget that in many countries, the average age of the teaching corp is very aged, and we know there is a high correlation of technology adverse, uh, adverse to, um, being adverse to technology by the time people are more aged. It's simply a fact of life. We are used to something, and it costs a bit uh, more. Let's say I'm already in the la in the, you know, on the right-hand side of the distribution, so I feel it on myself, despite the fact that I'm a bit of a geek and a techie. But you, you see that there is uh, this um, resistance towards uh, adapting to change. It will change the way we work, for sure, in the sense that not because a technology exists, it will be adopted, but sooner or later, we will need to have a workforce, all type of occupations, that needs to work with AI and generative AI. So again, you need different type of skills to be able to complement that. And um, however, I think we are not that badly placed in the sense that we have been able to identify 
skills that are needed throughout, that were needed before AI was the advent of AI, and they will be needed afterwards. So what perhaps educational system can do is focus on endowing people with those very skills, create stronger links with the labor market, because it's going to be an, a skill endowment and empowerment throughout. And then what we see is that very many people are panicking today about the fact there will be new jobs that we don't know anything about and those of today will disappear. If you look at the analysis and you go down to the tasks component and therefore the skills needed for certain tasks, what comes across very neatly is that it's a recombination. Certain tasks will just be automated, will be just uh, become uh, done automatically and others will be recombined in different jobs. So it's not a black or white. It's a gray area which we need to mold in a direction that is societal enhancing. And that is what we need to do together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Odi Pekka, you are already, you know, in the, in the midst of, of that. So what, what, you know, as an educator, you know, uh, what are the kind of challenges and also opportunities that you see, you know, in this new development? So generative AI, so how has it kind of changed the way that you think about uh, education and, and how do you see the evolution coming as well, you know, so what should we be prepared for? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in this very, very important and, and interesting uh, topic. Uh, really, kind of when the first versions of the chat GPT uh, came out, were launched, uh, there were very kind of concrete questions that came to our table at the IB. Uh, I think the first thing that really emerged was the question that how do we hinder it that students won't use this tool for cheating? And that was a kind of a big question. We at the IB, we have um, as part of the diploma program, we have this uh, extended essay, which actually counts for the grades at the end of the, of the diploma program. So it kind of means a lot for us. And having gone, going through that consideration that how should we approach this challenge, uh, we actually noticed that this is nothing new to us, that already there had been a situation where internet is known to be full of essay factories, where you can buy essays to be made by somebody else. So in this case, it was just a machine that was doing that. And we had already an um, academic integrity policy in place which says that it's the role of the teacher to engage in the process of writing that essay in order to make sure that it's really the product of that student and also that if AI is used in writing an essay it should be quoted the same way that scientific research used would be quoted. And then we actually took the approach that in this situation, it's not for us to try to get students caught from cheating, but we should try to embrace these new possibilities that are connected um, with artificial intelligence. IB educational approach is inquiry based. So it's very natural for us to kind of utilize that curiosity and a new tool, which is something that young people today are using widely. So I think it's our task as educators to make sure that we can engage in discussions with students about what are the risks and what are the possibilities of this new tool and how they can be, um, how that new tool can be used in an ethically sustainable way. Of course, then comes other questions also. It comes questions that 
uh, how this can be used as a support for teaching. How can it be used to lower the administrational burden that many teachers around the globe are, uh, face, are faced with? And also, we've been gathering a lot of the experiments that our 5,600 schools around the world are doing. And there are kind of very exciting models how to use AI or ChatGPT as an extra student in a class to kind of being able to compare that, what are the answers that ChatGPT is giving? Are they kind of true? Why they are the like they are? What role does the data have behind those answers? And so on. And, and also kind of be as a kind of a research aid for teachers and students, for teachers also for preparing classes and so on. So our approach is really to engage the whole IB community to learn and to discuss and involve in dialogues about this new uh, kind of development that we as humans have been capable of creating. Thank you, Olipeka. One more quick follow-up question. Uh, you know, IB, and actually you've shown very well how um, AI can be actually used in a, you know, productive pedagogical way uh, in education, but IB is also the baccalaureate and giving it's also an exam and giving a certified degree. So how has it changed the way of, so can you think of a way to actually make uh, AI uh, authorized while taking an exam? And are you thinking about, you know, changing the exam model so that, you know, it, this could be, we could actually assess the uh, human machine uh, collaboration and not just what, uh, you know, uh, humans can do? Yes, um, that, that is a very good question. And we are looking at alternative ways for assessment. And as we are moving uh, to digital assessment system in IB, that opens a kind of huge possibility to have assessment systems that are better at telling what is the potential of the students, what are the things that students are capable of doing, uh, not just kind of knowing, but also capable of doing with what they know, and, and also kind of looking at what is the capability of students to have learned really deeply something in a way that they are capable of doing it in different contexts. Uh, and these are possibilities that we're very much looking forward. And of course, kind of thinking about an open book type of an approach where maybe kind of AI in the future could be um, a kind of a partner with the student in the assessment system to show that what they're capable of doing together. Thank you. Todd, so you are, you know, one of the experts of creativity and, and actually have always been interested in, in the digital dimension of, of things. So what do you see as, you know, the new opportunities, challenges uh, that um, Generative AI in particular, you know, uh, uh, brings to, to, to creativity and the way we think about it. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Stefan, and happy to be here. Uh, thanks for your invitation. So first, I'd like to make a link directly to the OECD concept, because, in fact, uh, the, in terms of economic development, um, this makes me think of Joseph uh, Schumpeter, who talked about 
creative destruction and how some things get invented and it destroys previous practices. And it opens opportunities, but it also uh, creates a loss of uh, things that we grew up doing or knowing how to do. And so we're at a turning point here so it's kind of an exciting moment in human history to see a massive creative destructive incident happening. And uh, so this new AI, uh, generative AI system is changing jobs, changing tasks, changing the way that we relate to information. And uh, so we can see that, like for example, students and how they learn, teachers, how they teach, and people in all different jobs are repositioning themselves these days. So it's a very uh, good time to be a creativity innovation researcher, to notice, to observe the volcano exploding in front of us. Um, and uh, one of the things that I would say in terms of challenges and benefits is to uh, notice that this new phenomenon is creating, uh, let's say, four uh, use scenarios at, which may not have the same percentage of the people in each. And so what I'd like to mention here, I'm referring to something we developed in a paper that's out there on internet available uh, called the Manifesto about Creativity and Artificial Intelligence. And some of the co-authors are here in the room today. For example, Michael Hanchett. Hansen and, uh, and Vlad here, who already talked, and others. And um, so we position this new phenomenon in terms of four uh, ways people may react to it. The first way is, let's say, we called it shutdown, because a lot of human nature is based that we are kind of lazy creatures. And so if you got this super system to do to give a lot of answers to stuff, you can just rely on it uh, and take whatever it says. It's even easier than looking on internet where it gives you like the top things. And you have to read it and look at the first few top things until you get bored and synthesize it. Here, the answer is sort of pre-prepared for you. The second big use case uh, possibility is what we call plagiarism 3.0. Um, it's the super plagiarism. The problem with that is that there are now AI systems that detect that it was AI who did it. So that's getting more tricky. Um, but it is a great temptation. The third is what we call human made 100% human, um, which is the scenario that some people are going to say, I reject this and I do it all by hand the old way. And that has some new value, in fact. The question is, what is the percentage of the population that's going to go into those three use cases? But here's the fourth. It's called co-creation. And we spell that a new way now with creation, C-R-E-A-I-T-I-O-N. And um, uh, that is what we think is the most interesting, the most promising. The question is, is how to accompany people to go into that co-creative mode because we were not, we did not grow up with it, or let's say get used to it yet. And to study how can we, what is the best way to go into co-creation with the new tools? Thank you very much. So we already have one question. So, you know, you can go and raise your flags and, uh, you know, we'll go into the discussion. So go ahead. We We'll take uh, uh, two questions at a time, so that, uh, so go ahead. Thank you so much. Well, congratulations for this subject. It's very, very interesting. And my question is about the, um, it's about this. In the next future, uh, will the creativity come more from humans or artificial intelligence? My question finds some arguments because in real life, we have now some generative artificial intelligence in some areas, for example, in marketing. And as Professor Lubart talked about creativity destruction, so that's my question. Thank you so much. We'll take the next one. Go ahead, uh, Alexander. 
I, I was wondering if maybe, you know, artificial intelligence gives us an opportunity to realize that maybe we did education wrong, right? M maybe we actually started to cultivate this idea of micro abilities. So for instance, you know, when, when you want to produce something like an architect, right, and, and then in an educational setting, be that at any level, K to 12 or university level, right, basically the equivalent of what we do is to say, well, can you use a hammer and a nail and then e even more absurd, can you write a paragraph about how you're using a hammer and a nail? But, but these kinds of micro skills, micro capabilities, they don't really tell us much, right? And, and, and given the fact that now with artificial intelligence, we can easily write these kinds of essays, maybe simply points out the fact that we should have never asked these kinds of questions because that just don't make any sense. Can, can you say something? Thank you. Let's start with Oli Pekka. Thank you for, for, for very interesting questions. First about the kind of creative question. I, I don't want to be a kind of a uh, future or fortune, future teller. Uh, I cannot predict what will happen because it depends on what decisions we are making. But I would like to say that I think this development asks us to you uh, asks us to define that what it really means to be human and when we're talking about creativity uh, i think it has a value of itself if we think about what is the amount of joy that creativity brings to people and i'm not now only thinking about um, people enjoying music or art, but I'm talking about people creating, being creative themselves. I think that is something that I would not like to see us let go or have some kind of a shortcut to have somebody else to take care of that. And I think it is also, a, as, as kind of Joe Acosta minister was saying the morning, it is a deeply a human quality. We're talking about kind of what is our ability to play, to be kind of joyful and also do some serious play. And with the serious play, I'm thinking of, if we, if we think of the big challenges that we are faced with, the kind of polo crisis that we talk about these days, the character of those polo crises is really, they are kind of adaptive challenges or problems, which means that they are connected to us as humans. So there isn't actually anybody, any machine who can solve those challenges um, kind of from us. So it's really the question that, um, how we as humans, how do we behave? How do we treat each other? How do we consume? How do we see the nature? How egoistic we are in our actions? And those challenges will be our challenges also in the future. And we need to be innovative and creative also in the future to be able to give better solutions for those systemic challenges than what we have been so far. I fully agree with the second question that I think this is a huge opportunity to ask very fundamental questions about education, also about schooling, that what is school really for? What is education for? And I think we have done certain things wrong. Thank you, Maria Gracia. Yeah, so um, I can't agree more with Oli Pekka about the fact that we need to put AI at the service of people and not people at the service of, call it, uh, you know, a disruption like uh, Alain Schumpeter or call it a new technological paradigm a la dosi. The, the concept is the same. It's something that comes to life and distracts everything that we know and we need to do things differently. But by the time we say putting human 
you know, the humans at the center, I think we have to be very practical. By the time we say ethics, it needs to be something very concrete. And in the case of UNESCO, it means putting back human rights, human dignity, and fundamental freedoms at the center. Let's not forget that generative AI can use data that we would never like to be mixed, for instance. So these things need to be taken care of. Now, going back to the education thing, uh, let's uh, demystify a bit AI, okay? <clears throat> AI is as intelligent as those that program it. And I think this we should never forget, which means that if we are going to have better AI in the future, we need people that have the skills to program it. And you were saying it, and I can't agree more, we already have, so the problem of the generative AI and the cheating issue was kind of soon resolved in the sense that you can program system, generative system that check on the cheating issue. The problem is very often that educators don't know how to use it. So the problem is not in the use of the tool. The problem is the use on the assessment and enforcement, which is not only a problem for education nevertheless, but this remains a problem. Now, there is something that is painful, but <coughs> I think we should remember, and this. To some extent, generative AI is putting humanity in front of democratization, that is. I'm sure you're all familiar with all these studies until very recently, putting the question on the table that 46%, 9%, 15% of people can be made redundant by automation. By the time we were talking about those numbers, typically the ones at risk were what we used to be called the blue collars, people doing routine tasks. Now, the democratic part of generative AI is that it makes creativity redundant to some extent, right? So to some extent, puts levels the playing field. We all need a reshuffling, we all need a rethinking of not only the way we educate, but even, and that was a point made by some of the speakers, the micro certification, that is, can we really afford to have people in a course for four years before giving a certification? And how do I avoid what is typically called, and this was the point of Oli Pekka, like should we rethink what we did wrong in education and what we should do differently? So how do I avoid the market for lemons? The market for lemons in the jargon is whereby you look for someone in the labor market and you think that person has the skills you need and then it turns out that, sorry, it was mismatched, it's not exactly what I was looking for and too bad, I'm a small enterprise, it's one, for instance, it's one fourth of my working force and now I am in losses and I need to shut down because I simply cannot afford it. So there are a number of consequences that go well beyond the education uh, only. And just last point about the marketing, for instance, and doing things better. I mean, I don't want to scare anybody, but if you're afraid of AI alone, watch out for AI and actually neurotech powered by AI. Because I think, and I mean, I'm one of those that doesn't have the, um, the vocal command on the phone, by no means. I'm one of those that always closes the, the, the camera on my computer, unless I have to do an interview or something. Why? Because with all the, the mechanism that exists, of course, people can get my eye, the, how many times I blink, how many times I move my hands by the time I talk, etc. And while as people, you're looking at me now, but in 30 seconds, you're going to look elsewhere because you can't keep the attention, the machine can. So the, all this information is put together in order to have an, an inference about what you're thinking, what you're feeling, if you're comfortable or not, and be elaborated thanks to AI which means I can exactly know what are your weak spots, when do you have them, how to convey a certain idea. So actually, again, unfortunately, the promises and the tricks are in the mix. And this is what we have to address, last point, in a more future-oriented way. Too often, we have an approach to problems that is let's do an analysis, very going backward, backward looking, not having a scanning of the horizon, not having a foresight, for instance, approach. And then we come up with a solution. By that time, technology, for the pace, the scope, the, the scale that, for instance, AI is having now, and Neurotech is expected to have, we published a report on the 13th of July on the Neurotech landscape, and that's where you can see some evidence of the amount of money invested in this field and the consequences also for education. Then you might want to take a different approach to analytic. You want to have an analysis that goes at the past but already tries to foresee the future because otherwise by the time the result is there, the world is different, so it doesn't apply. Thank you. <coughs> okay. I'd like to so give a, a little uh, additional point of view on those two questions we had. 
So um, the first one was, uh, are we still going to sort of need our creativity for humans and all, given these AI systems that are coming out? And I'd say, first of all, that, you know, as you know, among humans, there's a wide range. Some people are more creative than others. And some AI systems, some generative AI systems, are more creative than others, in fact. And um, the, the, very, uh, the most recent work that we're tracking suggests that at the moment, generative AI systems that have been exposed to huge databases like everything on internet, which was created by humans, by the way, um, are, they are pr able to give some creative ideas in creativity tasks that we give those systems. I can develop it more, but at the moment, let's say that. Uh, but when you start to feed into those systems what they have generated themselves, you get what's called mad cow disease in AI. <laughs> this is true. This, this is recent work. And so um, after 10 iterations of feeding an AI system what itself generated over and over, it starts to generate gibberish, which is like a cow eating the bones of other cows. It starts to get genetically very sick. Um, uh, second of all, the other question was, have we, in fact, we're discovering we did it all wrong in the educational system, and we can be sad. Um, well, you know, before we had cars, people learned to ride a horse. Once we have cars, everyone said, why are we learning to ride a horse? That was stupid. We have cars. Um, of course, it was kind of useful before cars. Now we have been training people to do stuff, and along comes generative AI. It's a new car. It's a new kind of vehicle. And so we're saying, bah, should we still teach them how to ride a horse? Okay? So, um, yeah. Uh, it might be kind of stupid to continue with the current educational system as of now, but back then it seemed pretty relevant until recently the educational system was doing some relevant stuff. Thank you, David, Michael, and shortly Alexander again. <coughs> really, uh, thank you for this conversation. Very, very, um, uh, very intriguing to me. Uh, Todd, when you were talking about Schumpeter, what came to mind was actually Thomas Kuhn, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, somebody. And the story that came out was about Galileo and the story around does the earth revolve around the sun or does the sun revolve around the earth? And he really points out about these paradigm shifts that are happening, and this is what's I think, happening right now. And in his book, he calls out that there are certain individuals that benefit from the status quo. And so probably my question is, who is benefiting from the status quo right now? Um, OK. OK. Um, I, tend, I, I look at cognition as, as a distributed process, and in humanity, we've, done, we've redistributed our cognition several times, printing being an example, writing was another, a previous example. This is happening extremely fast, and so that's really a lot of the challenge to integrate it. Um, as an educator, uh, I'm thinking about what we wrote about in creative co-education and some of the things that came up today, and especially, Arlie Paco, what you were, the scenario you brought up about having testing with the student and the student's AI as, as a scaffolded system. How do we bring the students into this discussion more? It's their world, and as Gabriel Ramos brought up, they are actually better at some of this than we are. Um, and it seems like we need to, it has to be a scaffolded system from our perspective. We can't just turn the world over to them. But how do we bring them in? Because it seems like they need to be brought into this thought process because they're going to be distributing their cognition. That, that was an old uh, flag that you had? Alexander, I thought that you wanted to speak. Oh, okay. Well, this is more just like a comment, but, but uh, the, the, the statement was made that AI can only be as good as the programmer programming it. I mean, I, I, I think that could be a very dangerous misconception. 
And, I'm, and I, I programmed some very simple AI systems, and, and some of the answers that it would produce completely surprised me, and I never programmed in. in. So maybe this was just a weird kind of thing, but at a much more alarming level, you know, Sam Altman basically s says, admits, right, that some of the behavior that ChatGPT ex exposes was, never, was something that they never programmed in. So there's a lot of emerging and surprising things happen. So I wouldn't this, I, I would not think of, a, this could be a, just a dangerous kind of misconception. So one has to be careful. Thank you. So Todd, Matt right there, and then uh, Uli Pekka. So Todd, go ahead. Okay, well, in terms of the first question, how uh, when there's a paradigm shift, some people benefit, some uh, <coughs> don't. I'd like to cite a study that was done on historical data when Charles Darwin proposed his theory of evolution. Who benefited and who didn't? Those who adopted it the most quickly were the younger scientists of the British Scientific Society, and those who rejected it and resisted it most were the older ones who had more um, prestige to lose. Um, who is in the system as of today for education? I got bad news for you. It's a ton of teachers and administrators who have spent their life and who were good products of that system and decided as young people to stay the rest of their career at school. So we have a huge vested interest group called all the teachers and faculty of all schools around the world. Um, so um, this is bad, very bad news. Uh, secondly, uh, so resistance will be great. Um, secondly, uh, in terms of the other comment there or question um, from Michael, uh, you know, should students be involved in rethinking? Of course, I think they should, like any a uh, customer group should be involved in redefining the new marketplace because they need to have uh, buy into the new concept um, and promote the next generation of learning, I think. You can't really totally top down it from there, especially because uh, m many of the current educators did not grow up um, with internet and a telephone in their hand as they were born and a Gmail account at birth, whereas the <laughs> current uh, generation did. No. And so um, I was recently interviewed by some elementary school students doing a project on prehistory, and I was defined as a prehistoric creature because, <laughs> therefore subject to interview for this project, because I was born before cell phones existed. I was born before internet and Gmail accounts existed. And therefore I was defined as a prehistoric object worth an interview to some new elementary school students, if you can imagine. That's my answer to those questions. Yeah, we feel that pain too, I think, uh, because I don't think any of us was, war was born after the phone, the <laughs> cell phone, so <laughs> all those in this room. But let me go back. So who's benefiting from this? I think the OECD produced really seminal work already some years ago. This was in relation to companies, which was called the best versus the rest. That is, those that are benefiting are those that are at the right-hand side of the distribution of skills, of income, and of opportunities. And of course, by the time you're there, you want to keep the situation as it is, because of course, I mean, you become richer and richer, you feel more powerful, more powerful before. And so redistributing this power, redistributing the knowledge, giving elements to the broadest part of the society, both young and old, because let's not forget, this is not only about the young, but I will come back to your point later, which is very useful. The issue is especially bring about in the AI revolution, which as some call it, given that now everybody considers it to be a general purpose technology, how do we bring the older on? How are we going, are we going to allow people to even use basic service in health because they were going to be powered by AI and they, if they cannot use even the computer or the phone in a decent way, how are they going to be able to access some basic services like those. So that's the, the big question to me. And so it is the inequalities that again is the richer, the one that are better equipped with training and all the rest of them. 
this links to that question of you disagree with me, which is very nice because I think that is, uh, I mean, that's when we get sorted the problem. Let me do a step back, okay? Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the moratorium request that appeared in the summer by those that actually opened the door and then said, oh my dear, the cat is gone out, right? So there were a number of scientists arguing, but of course we know there have been a lot of also contractual relationship in the back supporting the idea of a moratorium. Now, in the history of technology, has never worked, right? Let alone with AI. And in addition, it was coming, supported by some, that was evidently running behind in the technological race that was happening, and is still happening. So I'm sorry, but I don't really buy the fact that the cat is going out, oh, sorry, we didn't realize this, and is doing things, because by the time you have the right skills, you do know what you're doing and what you're not doing. The problem, for instance, lies in the fact that, have you ever seen, there are very few cases around the world where in engineering schools and informatic type of uh, colleges, you teach ethics of computing. When a data set is biased, what you should do for that, how to adjust the algorithm, how to put parameters. So for instance, this is something we are actively pursuing. We recently uh, signed an agreement, for instance, with Nielit, which is the key leading institution in India, so we are talking scale here, that trains 1.8 million people a year in computing. And we are adding a module to teach them that it's not only about optimizing in RAM use, in, um, for instance, um, making the algorithm faster, it's about the energy you consume, it's about putting checkpoints in the algorithm so that it, go, it doesn't go out of control, it doesn't discriminate against people, say, of different race or different religion, it doesn't discriminate against women, it respects um, privacy and other, you know, uh, very much needed components of the programming. So, yes, I think there is a lot to do there, and we shouldn't buy the arguments of those that have created, between brackets, the problems, because the possibilities and the opportunities that AI generates are very much there. But there are some, you know, downsides to it, and they need to be addressed. Now, the very last point is about how to engage the young people. We need more multi-stakeholders approach whereby we don't look at them always as a problem, but we look as part of the solution. Also because let's not forget that by the time we will be gone, they will be on this earth still. Also for sustainability issues. So what we have done, for instance, in two ways, just to give examples at UNESCO, is we have what is called the Youth Forum, which every year focuses on uh, different topics. So one of them has been AI, for instance. Discusses with them solution and engages them and have them talking to the ministers. And then we have done a program of grant scheme called the YAR, Youth as Researchers, to have them themselves find the solution to the problem. Not like, you know, we decide about you, we know what is best for you, and off you go, you adopt. One very, very last point about the digital native. Let's not forget that they need to be told and taught the critical thinking. Because screening, moving the finger on, a, on an iPad doesn't mean dominating the tools. And that's even true for technology, actually. Absolutely. So, <laughs> and so perhaps, so we'll go to, to Oli Pekka, uh, just, you know, on the question of uh, the programmer, etc. So I think what Margaret is saying is basically that there are people behind these systems and actually they know, kind of know what they're doing or they can yeah. check, they can check, uh, you know, what is happening. But what Alexander was doing is that we don't fully understand the details of the of how the system itself is actually producing this thing, which doesn't, uh, it's not against what you're saying, you know, but, it's, but I think yeah. it's not exactly the and same level of, but the of um, is that We that are not real prog programmers, we might be uh, surprised, but it is not acceptable. It's like when a surgeon, surgeon said then said, oh, I didn't expect this to happen. I mean, either you're a professional or not. Mm. Those that are not in the business, of course, are surprised at what comes out. But those that are in the business know exactly well what is coming out. And so they need different parameters to be checked. So, Odi Pekka, go ahead. And then we'll have two questions. So, I, you know, think of uh, the two questions as short questions, because then we, we will have to wrap up. Go ahead, Odi Pekka. Thank you. I would like to start with the question of how to bring in the students in this development, which is a central question. Uh, I think we need to, in the education systems, we have to 
enable the students to learn about, learn with, and also learn for a society where AI is a big thing in its different uh, dimensions. Uh, and that's really the question that what is the what is the curriculums that we are having in our education systems and how relevant from the students' point of view our existing uh, our existing curriculums are. And uh, it, it is the, the the possibility of the of the uh, AI that it enables us to do certain shortcuts. And we need to engage our students in the discussion that which shortcuts should we take and which not. And what is gained through taking those shortcuts and what is lost. And I think it is like other technologies that, like internet, as it was referred to, that it has, it can go two ways. It can narrow down your worldview, or it can kind of widen it up to enable to see kind of new things that you've not seen before. And I think that is the role of education, to support the students to widen up and reach their full potential in engaging with the world. And I think that kind of answers the question that who is definitely not benefiting uh, from the new possibility. And that is, for example, the young people who don't have access to quality education. I think that is a very clear situation. Then about the last question, I agree that this is a bigger question. We like to say that it's just a tool, but I think it is a different tool. It's not the similar type of tool we've used before. With the earlier tools, uh, we have outsourced knowledge earlier, like in computers, mobile phones. But now we are also outsourcing certain types of competencies. And that is a new situation, and, and we really need to think about it. I think considering education uh, I think the biggest challenges that are coming through AI are the indirect uh, impacts. And by that, I mean that how AI will change our societies. And in there, I am worried about the challenge. What are the new possibilities to create or ruin the trust base in our societies with certain AI applications. And that is such a vital question. I'm afraid that what we've seen with internet and social media is actually just a small part that what could be done with AI and fake news, fake images, fake video, which all challenge that what can we believe as humans that what's true, what's reality, what has really happened. And again, therefore, kind of critical thinking skills will be coming so, so much more important in that society. Thank you. So we have five minutes. I will just take the two questions that were raised before and short questions, please. Hello. 
Hi, I'm Renaud Chabrier, a French specialist of drawing and science and animation. And um, when um, we talk about generative AI in general, everybody focuses on uh, um, text input and text output. So, uh, of course, you, you know probably that we can generate image with text, with print, but there's something very interesting that come, came out that you can control the generation of image with drawing. And now there is a convergence between uh, deep learning and information theory, so it's very, very interesting. And it um, um, makes clear that uh, drawing is also a mean to control AI. And, I, and of course, it's very interesting in education because it can be <laughs> drawing at very for, at young age. It can be very extended applications, uh, complicated application later. So, uh, is there, for, as you know, uh, some uh, beginning of a policy for that uh, reflection on that topic? Thank you. There have been some uh, interesting conversations already about creativity and connection with well-being um, and also ethical creativity. And I'm curious your thoughts on the intersection of these concepts with AI. In other words, what you see as the key opportunities or risks that AI brings to well-being and or creativity, uh, ethical creativity. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll do a and that will be then, you know, we'll, then we'll go to, to lunch and continue the discussion uh, uh, informally. But uh, so I'll go, uh, Maya Grads, no? Do you? I don't want to take all the time, that's why okay. I was asked. So short answer because we only have so one minute each to, you know, and actually share what is the kind of a key takeaway you would like us to keep in mind. Uh, Maya Grads, I'll go, go ahead. So actually the, the thing of having uh, the drawings inside is actually about the design. And this is a general shift that is happening in many policies, not only the one related to AI, that is having things done, whether it's about inclusion or ethical, by design. That means thinking ahead before the thing goes into production. And of course, we do know about the possibility of AI to create images. And actually to me, that is much more scary, as uh, also someone else was mentioning, than the text itself, because um, it can create fake things that are very difficult to check, given that today all images are pixels. So that's where, you know, the trick is. So um, indeed, it's, a, it's something that is very promising, but needs to be included. And again, it's about the mix of skills, going back to the educational issue, where you have the social emotional and the creative skills that are not typically the, th the one you would think in programmers, but they need to be done together. Key opportunities at risk for well-being. Well, um, engagement in society is one. Let me mention really the, the big challenges. Democracy, if you ask me, because by the time there are fake news, misinformation and disinformation, this is where we are heading to. And I mean, this year, I don't know if anybody has realized, but I think we have about 90 elections around the world, which means that the power balance of this world can be tilted in a, in a second, thanks to that. And there is the lack of readiness, which actually creates also, in terms of well-being then, stress for people. And this is where, you know, having a minimum endowment of skills for anybody in, in society is something that is very needed. And very, very last point is about um, uh, trying to understand better how the real world and the digital world overlap. That is, what we have been observing with AI, exaggerating this, but also before, is that we really need to have a better understanding of how people behave in the virtual world because we know there are people that become very aggressive, for instance, or they feel at ease, so that goes back to the question on, uh, on uh, well-being. And now this translates in the real world, and vice versa, the behavior that are brought. So it, we actually are doing now a project which is called Digital Anthropology, because this kind of understanding is missing from the, the palette of policymakers, and actually hinders the ability of designing and implementing effective and, you know, by design ethical policies, because simply the optimization mechanism whereby you do something and people respect, respect typically the same incentives doesn't work anymore. And you have, for instance, going back to the example of democracy, votes shifted by five, eight percent just with a tweet. So we need to understand better so that also there can be regulation or structures in society institution that can stand the test of the AI era, basically. Thank you. Odipeka? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, periods of time, and I, I would like to concentrate on the on the last question. Uh, what are the biggest kind of challenges, uh, kind of ethical challenges, and challenges for well-being? Uh, I think I think we should make sure that we uh, we are capable of tackling the question of protection of minors in this development. Uh, I think we've done not a very good job with understanding the impact of kind of mobile phones or social media to minors, all that content um, and things happening in that environment. And uh, I think the UNESCO paper raised a very valuable point when it when it kind of touched this issue. Um, those are certain things that we might be needing certain regulation in the future too. Um, otherwise, I would enjoy us creating ethical codes to this environment of well-being uh, cause. When we're talking about ethical codes, it's something that I think everybody uh, in schools should engage in the discussions of creating those codes and understand why they are created. Cause that's something that we will be living with this situation, our lives and especially the students of today will be doing that. So they need to be conscious of the challenges and the ways to make sustainable choices. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, I would say that first of all, um, in terms of well-being, uh, from what I understand of generative AI systems, uh, they seek to optimize different things that are coded in the system. So if we can figure out how to code human well-being into the equation to be optimized, that would be the, uh, let's say, the way to deal with it in a way. Um, and uh, that involves knowing what human well-being actually means and uh, being able to somehow operationalize it uh, in these systems. And secondly, in terms of a key take-home message, I just want to uh, go back to the co-creative mode uh, and say how, for me, that's the big challenge, how to organize education and mobilize people so that they are interested and want to go into the co-creative mode because when you give people a new tool, if they can learn how to use it and see its value, um, it might actually uh, lead to an enhanced state of um, human society. And so uh, to avoid the uh, just let AI do it and I can go watch TV, to avoid the I'll just let AI do it and I'll say I did it. Um, or um, other options, uh, which might be just to say, let's just do it the old way, which might be fine, but we might miss an opportunity if we were to just throw away AI. Anyway, I doubt we would or could. Thank you very much. So please join me in thanking our great panelists. And uh, so.